Why the Cross by Father Edward Lean, Part 2, The Tree of Life, Chapter 6, First Reading. Behold my servant, my soul delighteth in him. He shall not cry out, nor have respect to persons, neither shall his voice be heard abroad. The problems of existence cannot be solved by theories born of pure reason. They can be solved only practically. Very many souls, and these the most sensitive, find themselves a prey to an exasperation amounting to a veritable agony of bitterness in face of the perplexing problems presented by human existence. There is much in the regular course of events that jars on their sense of the fitness of things. Every effort of reason to construct a satisfying theory of the cosmos collapses in the face of inescapable facts. Trials multiply, most frequently, in the path of those who are least deserving of them. There are sorrows, failures, and sufferings that appear to be without meaning or purpose. Error is, oftentimes, punished as severely by circumstances as deliberate malice. In the catastrophes of nature, the good are overwhelmed equally with the wicked. The virtuous and the high-minded are, generally speaking, thwarted, ridiculed, and discredited. The cunning and the resourceful and the unscrupulous rarely lack favor and applause. Nowhere are these outrages on reason so vividly dramatized as they are in the life of Christ. The Savior was utterly blameless in his conduct, and yet no one encountered such lack of appreciation and such positive opposition as he. He was kind, wise, and beneficent, and yet men turned upon him with more fury than they would vent upon an avowed enemy of mankind. He was eminently fitted to guide men to the goal toward which they are perpetually striving, and yet he found very few to enroll themselves in his following. He was endowed with every quality that makes for success. Nevertheless, humanly speaking, he was an utter failure. Nothing but good came from him, and little but evil was meted out to him. Christ lived among men and conversed with them daily. He worked for them, and he worked with them. The angels themselves, what is more, God himself, could not, with the most intense scrutiny, detect a flaw in his conduct. In spite of that, he was little appreciated by the men among whom he lived, if exception be made of a few discerning persons. The success of evil and the apparent failure of good forced itself on the attention of Christ day by day. He constantly and personally experienced the effects of the one and the other. He, like other men, found his deep sense of what ought to be challenged by the problems thus presented. Unlike other men, he was neither dismayed nor baffled by these problems. Christ solved the riddle of existence by living. It was not as if he first constructed an hypothesis and then tested it by facts. It was not through practical experience that he found that his theory was a working theory. He held the solution to life's problems from the beginning. He knew he possessed it. An inability to comprehend the meaning of the evil, the pain, and the cruelty of existence and a passionate resentment against the irresistible invasion of life by what is at one and the same time felt to be both unreasonable and intolerable are the enduring causes of man's unhappiness. One can submit to what one understands. One cannot but experience revolt against what does brutal violence to the reason. Christ's theory of existence is the only one that can banish this incomprehension from life and, with it, 
the unhappiness that has its source in that incomprehension. This is the significance that underlay his words when he said, Learn of me, and you shall find rest for your souls. Rest implies attainment, contentment, peace, and consequently, happiness. To learn of Christ is to adopt practically Christ's philosophy of existence. From the moment a man seriously sets about applying to the direction of his own life the principles that governed Christ's life, there takes place an immediate illumination. There begins to be discerned a definite scheme into which can be fitted and through which can be coordinated and rendered intelligible all the elements that constitute the human experience of the disciple of Christ. The impression of a fatal and uncontrolled disorder fades away. The purpose behind happenings that hitherto appeared senseless, the fruitful action of suffering that before seemed purely negative and destructive, all this emerges from the obscurity in which it had been shrouded. The threads of the tapestry of life that looked so unsightly and so hopelessly entangled begin to reveal a firm design of order and beauty. The interrelation between circumstances that to another would look wholly unconnected becomes apparent. To adopt Christ's principles practically and to take his yoke on one's shoulders are one and the same thing. Men shrink from the yoke because to the imagination it conjures up visions of intense strain. Vainly has the Savior assured them that his yoke is easy. The fancy is busy at work forming somber pictures of the rough paths along which the yoke is to be borne. Hardships, toil, want, homelessness, opposition, unpopularity, derision, hatred, and even crucifixion, of a moral if not of a physical kind. All these defile rapidly before the mental gaze and inspire terror and repulsion. How could all that be light or easy? And yet, the Savior cannot lie. He is truth itself. Imagination in this, as in so many things, plays men false. It is not in the actual experiences of his life that Jesus invites us to imitate him, but in that fundamental spirit which was the wellspring of his actions in and his reactions to the world in which he lived. To take up the yoke of the Savior is not necessarily to do or to suffer such things as he did and suffered, but to show oneself such a man as he was in the arena of life. To express in a few words what kind of man the Savior was is not an easy matter. It could not be done had not Christ himself done it for us. To imitate Christ is to reproduce in oneself the fundamental traits of his human character. To do this, it is necessary to know what kind of man Christ was, to know what was the distinctive feature of his moral physiognomy. Men, in describing their fellows, constantly endeavor to convey an idea of their personality by a few words that will serve to present a true moral portrait. A man under discussion is described, for instance, as being upright, harsh, unfeeling, unaffected, obstinate, self-seeking, and so on. In these adjectives, or in a combination of them, there can be conveyed a fairly accurate notion of what a man is like. The description, if accurate, will enable one to form a shrewd judgment as to what may be expected of the person of whom there is question, were he placed in such or such circumstances. In social or business relations with such a one, it becomes possible to decide on the suitable line of action to adopt. 
One course would be advisable in dealing with the opportunist. Another would suit in transactions with the conscientious. It would be interesting to know if even the immediate disciples of the Savior ever endeavored to hit off his character in this way to one another when discussing him among themselves. How would they truthfully express him for what he was? It would not have been an easy thing to do. It would demand insight into character and spiritual acumen of a very high order. If the disciples of Christ ever made such an attempt, it is doubtful it would have been successful. For in striving to express what Jesus is, one is seemingly confronted with a personality of disconcerting complexity. In him is discerned a combination of qualities of the most opposite kinds. The Redeemer shows himself of incredible condescension towards sinners, while at the same time inexorable towards sin. He points out that loving the neighbor is a reflex of the love of God, and he states that nobody can aspire to be a disciple of his unless he hates father and mother and those most closely knit to him by ties of blood. He pursues moral evil relentlessly into the most secret recesses of thought. He will not allow any earthly loss, however great, to be weighed in the balance against sin. If thy eye scandalize thee, pluck it out. If thy hand scandalize thee, cut it off. In spite of that, he shows himself warmly appreciative of the least elements of goodwill on the part of sinful men. He is grateful for the least that men will offer him and yet he is contented with nothing short of the utmost. A cup of cold water given in his name will not go unrewarded, and then bewilderingly a complete sacrifice of one's all is taken as a matter of course. He is delighted with the ordinary workaday virtue and the rugged candor of a Nathaniel, and turns to tell his followers that they have to be perfect as their heavenly Father is perfect. He is transported with joy by an act of faith on the part of Peter, and a few moments later he stigmatizes him as a Satan, swayed and attempting to sway others by considerations of an earthly character. The erring and inconstant Peter is made the foundation stone of the church, while the faithful and virginal John is passed over for this office of trust. He remits sin with an ease that scandalizes the rigidly righteous, and he demands of all without exception the most exacting self-denial and the most flawless sanctity. He so deals with sin and sinners that one would judge that he regarded moral deformity as the normal thing in men. On the other hand, he as calmly demands complete perfection in conduct on the part of all those who listen to his instructions, as if he were utterly blind to human frailty. He manifests infinite tactfulness in treating with the wayward, infinite patience with the dull-witted, an inexhaustible consideration for the willful. And again, his words scorch and shrivel like vindictive lightning when he upbraids the hypocritical. He fulfills the lowliest offices toward his intimates and withal demands of them the most unquestioning loyalty as the price of his friendship. He is meek as a lamb led to the slaughter, and nevertheless his eyes can flash with the fire of fierce wrath. He is deeply compassionate towards distress of every kind. Yet he calmly exposes his followers to a fate in which suffering is their daily portion. He declares blessed the peacemakers and confesses that he himself is to be a source of division. He says that heaven is the reward of violent effort, but that only those who are as children shall enter therein. 
one might go on almost indefinitely multiplying these baffling contrasts. The more they are considered, the more difficult it might seem to trace a unity in this amazing variety. Yet there is a common element to be found in all, in strength or in weakness, in gentleness or in wrath, in justice and in mercy, in exigence and in condescension, Jesus acts in a way that is thoroughly characteristic. His greatness lies in the perfect equilibrium in him of qualities opposed to, but not contradictory of, one another. He attained the just measure in the expression of the different virtues because humility was the basis of his human character. Jesus is truly described when it is said of him that he was above all else a humble man. As a man, he could be spoken of as the personification of humility. It is his own description of himself. Learn of me, he said, that I am meek and humble of heart. Humility is based on a reverence toward God. It consists in knowing one's true position in the scheme of things and in abiding in that position. A clear idea of the nature of this virtue, which gave its distinctive cachet to the human character of Jesus, is not commonly held. An accurate analysis of it is not without its difficulty. Being but badly understood, its practice is rare. Everybody writes the venerable Lieberman, thinks it is a praiseworthy thing to speak continually of humility, and scarcely anyone possesses it. A little further on in the same context he says, I have frequently remarked that the word has scarcely any significance on the tongues of the majority of those that discuss it. It does not consist in a display of words, nor in the exercise of the intelligence, nor in a play of the imagination. Neither is it acquired by one's efforts, by natural activity, by a great output of energy, by painful eagerness. Real humility does not consist in outward action nor in seizing eagerly upon what is outwardly humble, nor in appearing before the eyes of others in a position or action that is lowly and humiliating. What then is it? It is a virtue that is based on a profound and enlightened reverence toward God. Its motive lies in a lowly and unqualified subjection to the Almighty, where there is absent a keen recognition of the illimitable claims of the sovereignty of God, humility cannot exist. Because of this absence, not only was humility not practiced by the pagans, it was not even known to them. The spirit of restraint and measure in action and aspiration inculcated by Aristotle and the other ancient philosophers has some traits of resemblance to the Christian virtue, but the resemblance is only superficial. The nothing too much of the pagans, their horror of the bizarre and the disproportionate, springs from a respect for the reason they esteemed in themselves. What they cultivated did not check or neutralize the inordinate love of one's own excellence that is so opposed to humility and is so fundamental a tendency in fallen human nature. This evil and inveterate tendency makes a man chafe against the necessary limitations inherent in his condition. To his native limitations as a creature are added the disabilities that weigh upon him as a fallen creature. This complexus of contracting and thwarting elements 
reduces man to a condition against which he is in a constant state of passionate resentment and sullen revolt. The instincts of the old man are perpetually instigating him to dissatisfaction with his position in the plan of divine providence. He is spurred on by pride to aspire after an untrammeled position that is not rightfully his. He claims an excellence that does not belong to him, a freedom from limitation that conflicts with his creatureliness, an immunity from suffering incompatible with his state of mortality and an independence of thought and will which is a divine prerogative. Humility is the virtue whose function it is to combat these evil tendencies of the pride of life, to aim at a moral position other than that assigned to one by the providence of God, to seek while being a mere man not to suffer from human limitations is implicitly to revolt against the Almighty. One who has a true reverence for God will not suffer himself to yield to these promptings of pride. From reverence is begotten the virtue of humility, which exercises a moderating and restraining influence on the false and disorderly aspirations of the human will and holds man firmly in his proper place in the scheme of reality man's true place is fixed relatively to the creator and to creatures to act as he ought as befits his position he must have an accurate and clear vision of that position hence Though humility is primarily a virtue of the will, it has a background of intelligence. Without intelligence there cannot be humility. The Christian virtue postulates as well a strong will and sound judgment. Intelligence must not in this context be confounded with learning. The learned are often unintelligent, and therefore proud. Jesus had a most penetrating intelligence. He saw his position with the utmost clearness. His will was resolute in commanding action regulated by his position. Jesus was in mind and will admirably equipped to practice and exemplify the virtue he so recommended. That will was as unbreakable as the most finely tempered steel. His intellect was of unapproachable power and clarity. He saw as never man did what God was, what man was, and what he himself as creature was. He could not err in calculating the position he was to keep and to hold. His deep reverence for God was the motive that held him in place, regulating the actions of will and intellect. As gravity draws the stone to earth, so regard for his heavenly Father caused Christ to gravitate to his place in creation. Having an overpowering sense of the rights of God, and of the duties of the creature, he was utterly humble. His humility was the very antithesis of the pride of Adam and was the undoing of that pride.